Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 7 of Space's Hard Vacuum with Cerberus. And today you are witnessing me literally just beginning the next project. There is no practice run, there is no test building. This is the test building. It's just all happening right now. I literally opened up the VAB and said, all right, let's make the next episode and started filming from scratch. And the base we're using here, that probe is, of course, the Luna 1. So naturally, we're going to be sending that to the moon. And I thought, uh, for a change, since I don't think I really have shown much of my build process uh, in the last, at least in the last episode, there wasn't a hell of a lot of it. I thought I would display it a little bit more uh, at, of course, two times acceleration because my my build process is painfully painfully slow even for me when i watch it again you'll actually find that like i I've, I've skipped all sorts of various bits where i spend 60 seconds 90 seconds 2 minutes just looking at the screen figuring out what i want to do but uh, gradually, over the next few minutes, we'll see this first the probe coming together. I uh, The only reason I really stuck this tank on here at this point underneath that battery was just to make the body of the thing long enough to fit that big extendable boom satellite dish thing on there. Because I just, I, I hate trying to stick stuff onto the round surface of that uh, of that probe core. So I've, I've got the solar panels on there and I'm going for just having the solar panels on there for now. Now, at this point, I believe the idea is that I'm going to have essentially an unguided probe. It's not going to have uh, RCS on it. It's just its its carrier vehicle is going to get it to whatever trajectory, obviously to the moon, of course, but on whatever, whatever trajectory it's going to end up on, and that's it. You know, decouple, and it's already on its path. So that's the... Uh, that's what I'm building this around to begin with. I switched that over to a conic tank because I realized that this fairing base is actually, it's not quite 2 meters, it's like 1.94 meters. And I know the engines I'm going to be using, uh, I'm going to be using a 2 meter size engine. So just to make everything a little bit more smooth in shape, I do a cone size. And now you'll see... Again, I believe I've shortened this quite a bit, but there were several minutes of me agonizing, as I always do, with choosing an engine. And of course, I have more to pick from now that we have the Tech Level 3, so I'm having a look at some. That Tribune is an option. So far, I'm I'm comparing them against that American, I forget what the number is, but the one that's attached there right now, it's an LR something like every other American one is. In the end, though, I decided not to go with that, I think because I wanted I wanted a liquid H2-powered engine, which this one here is, or at least it can be. The German J4R, I think. Yeah, you can. it can be switched to run on liquid H2 and liquid oxygen, which, of course, you, you need a kind of a big tank for, because that hydrogen takes up a lot of volume, but uh, it's a super efficient engine. The specific impulse on this one is well past 400 once I configure it. We'll see what we get here. Liquid H2 will bring that tech level up as high as we can. 400, like almost 500, you know, it's in the mid 400s for a specific impulse, which is, I mean, that's really quite good for any kind of chemical rocket engine. That's seriously good fuel efficiency. So I go with that. And I build from there. I say, okay, that's my upper stage engine because it's fantastic. And then we skip a few minutes here. We, we skip a lot of the one of the less glamorous parts of running a mod like this with this level, or a set of mods like this with this level of realism. And that is uh, balancing your RCS thrust. Which, of course, I've got the thrusters on the upper stage so that it can move around and flip back and forth between retrograde and prograde and do all sorts of transfer burns and circularization burns. It's The upper stage has a lot of work to do, a lot of different jobs to do, so we got to be able to point it in many different directions. 
and we'd rather be able to point it in many different directions without also pushing it in many different directions at the same time. The only thing we want really pushing this vehicle in any, in any direction to change its velocity is the actual rocket engine. So that takes, I, this probably took, I want to say, 10 minutes of me just, you know, dinking around trying to make that work. And eventually I get it set up. And then we have the upper stages basically done, so we're slapping interstage on there and we'll eventually find ourselves planning the launch stage, the, the first stage of this vehicle. And of course, you know, setting up the, the fairing size. I love these procedural fairings. The procedural fairings, the stretchy tanks, it's great because you can make anything, almost anything, any size you want. You know, you can have conic-shaped tanks to match up. You know, if you have a mismatch between the size of the engine, whatever you're carrying, you can just make a conic tank. Or you can have a super tall or really wide or any shape of fairing you want, and it's nice. The disadvantage, though, is that it does add a bit more time to my already terribly long build process. So, I think at this point, yes, I've chosen that German... D3 engine, fictional German D3 engine, of course, just to remind everybody that I'm using the Reaching for the Stars engine pack, which is all, it's alternate history stuff, just to make things a bit more interesting, so that I don't really know what to expect from the engines, because I can't go look them up, because they never actually existed, even if they're kind of like engines that did. But that, that D3, it's a pretty standard kerosene liquid oxygen uh, launch stage engine kind of the usual stuff good thrust decent specific impulse on the surface at sea level um, not so great comparatively in up in space but that's not what we need it for we need it to get us off the ground And so then comes the, now that we've got the basic structure of the rocket put together, we just have to adjust the sizes of our tanks, the, you know, the length of time each stage burns for, want to tweak the thrust to weight ratios so that we have a good amount of thrust at all points in the, in the launch. And then we're also uh, not, you know, not being too inefficient with mass and all those other sort of considerations that you don't really have to care too much about most of the time in the stock game, but you really do need to get it right uh, in the realism setup, because if you don't get it right, you're probably not getting into orbit. Or at the very least, you're not getting where you want to go unless you're really lucky. And while I don't mind getting lucky now and then on these kind of missions... I'd rather something succeed because I was good than because I was lucky, or at the very least, a combination of both. That I'm okay with. And so now, of course, we add the requisite two stretchy SRB boosters to help get us off the ground even faster. And uh, it occurs to me at this point, not that I change, I don't change the design of this rocket, but it occurs to me at this point to, I, may, I make a note to myself that maybe the next time I build a whole new launch vehicle from scratch, I might actually try a different sort of design concept. Even something so simple as adding, as having something with three solid boosters or four, or something, that, just anything that looks a little bit different, or even some liquid fueled booster stages, or something just a little different, because... This one here, and you'll, you'll, you'll see a, a full view of it here shortly. But basically, this, this vehicle, as well as... Well, this one I think I named... What did I name it? The Scimitar. The Scimitar 1. In keeping with my pointy things naming scheme, this is the Scimitar 1 launch vehicle. But, I mean, it looks the same as my other ones, my stiletto models, just at different scales. It's just bigger, but it's the exact same structure, exact same concept. So now it comes time to name the probe. And you see there, I name it Alice. And this time it's not an acronym. I don't even do an acronym. It's just Alice. The name, it's just the word. Why is it named Alice? Well, because it's going straight to the moon, of course. Hopefully without 
too many POWs, but lots of zooms. And the first test launch, well, at least, the, at the very least, it gets off the ground just fine. I always expect a staging problem somewhere the first time I fly a rocket I've just built. And I usually expect that to happen right on the ground, you know, having the payload fairings blow off as soon as I launch the, the rocket, or having some but not all of the launch clamps disengage so it's still just sitting there, or it falls over, or decoupling the second stage on launch, or something like that. But I managed to, uh, managed to not have that happen with this one. Although I did have, I did have one launch where well, I burnt out the boosters and dropped those away. This isn't the first launch you're seeing, you're seeing the second launch. The first launch, I got to the point where the launch stage, the lower stage that you see here, burnt out. And I went to decouple that and fire up the second stage, or at least prepare to. But I think what happened is instead, instead of decoupling the fairings and whatnot, I actually disengaged the payload from the upper stage inside the fairings, which caused a nice little explosion, and I kind of knew it was all over at that point. The second launch, you'll see really well here if you didn't spot it. Look at that. Up at the top, see that kind of big wide gap in there? That's, uh, that's that tank that was serving as a structural piece, basically a fuselage of sorts, a body for the, for the probe to hold the communications equipment and whatnot. And it's just not quite looking like it's attached to the satellite anymore, even though it still sort of is, because the satellite's hovering out there in front. And I'm looking at that as I make my circularization burn here, and I'm thinking, this isn't going to end well. But I, I, I figure, well, you know what? I still might as well continue with this. I know it's probably going to fail, but let's just see if I can get it to work. And let's just see if this works in principle. I mean, I, I didn't expect this to be the final product anyway, even as I was recording it, because you can see there I've got two of I've got two solar panels out. I built the thing with four, so two of them broke somehow during launch, or I don't even know, but two of them were broken and didn't work. But we get out here, we're halfway to the moon, basically, and it's time to do a course correction with the last of the fuel in the upper stage here. And then I use some RCS because it required it and I had the fuel available. So we burn that. I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll just see what happens. We'll, we'll see what goes wrong so I can have a better idea how to fix it. So we decouple here. And... Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> we have some more floating parts. So I time warp to turn off the collision and actually make it get away from the upper stage tank, and then it's you know, it's looking pretty good. Got that payload assist rocket at the bottom there, which I'm going to use, planning to use to just have it shoot past the moon at some point. I wasn't sure when. I was just going to try to fire it up and have it... Uh-oh, what's going on here? That's, oh boy, oh, that's getting worse. Oh, that's getting, oh, wow, that's, wow, what the hell is, uh oh, oh my god. What is going on here? And, yeah, then everything just explodes. Well, not everything. The actual probe body's still there, but everything else explodes. And of course, I have no attitude control. I have no battery, I have no solar panels. It's not going to work. And that's the end of that. So we quickly, we get right to the Alice Mark II. I found out the problem was actually that I had used a balloon tank. That silvery tank underneath the, the round probe initially had been a balloon tank, which it's got no structural strength, it's got almost no mass, it was empty. So anything attached to it just, it was glitching, it wasn't working. In real life, it, the tank probably would have been crushed or torn apart. In KSP, that's represented by it doing what it did however you want to describe what we just saw a minute ago with the floating parts clipping through each other. So I use a good old-fashioned service module, and I actually put some hydrazine in it too. I got rid of that payload assist kick motor solid booster thing on the bottom of the satellite. I instead opted for a good old-fashioned little orbital maneuvering engine and some uh, and some rocket fuel and some hydrazine and some RCS thrusters. So 
Uh, it's got its own propulsion. It's got its own control. And we're going to do it that way and hope uh, hope it, uh, the safer approach works out better. So here we go. Here's the inaugural launch of the Alice Mark II after two failed attempts with the Mark I. We have liftoff. And, you know, as usual, again, the launch, initially, it all goes quite well. I'm feeling good. I'm thinking I've got to figure out all the problems solved. I've got a real non-balloon tank, and ooh, that's pitched over a little too far, isn't it? Okay, we'll bring it back. And, okay, now it's going a little too steep. Uh, okay, well, we'll leave it. So I go hands-off, let it do its gravity turn, and... You know, let nature take its course and see how we end up trajectory-wise. I'm just waiting to see, you know, if I have to do manual course corrections, obviously I will. And I'm looking down here now, peeking inside the payload fairing, checking on those tiny micro RCS thrusters. I had them set up on action groups so that I could turn them off and on independently of the bigger thrusters on the upper stage. The idea being there that I, uh, I wanted to obviously have those turned off while the upper stage was maneuvering around because I had balanced the thrusters on the on the second stage. I didn't want the extra thrust from the satellite to be messing with that. Plus I didn't need to be consuming the extra RCS fuel. So at this point here I am doing some course corrections because it was sort of drifting left and right and doing all sorts of interesting things so I just let me rein that in. I also, uh, I decide that the the ascent is way too steep. So we ditch the boosters and then it's time to really shallow this climb out here. There's so little air at this altitude, 90 kilometers, that it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, I can kind of point in whatever direction I want and it's not really, it's not going to be too terribly, you're not going to see any aerodynamic instability. There's not enough air to cause that anymore. So we just point at the horizon, even though we're still flying upwards at, I don't know, 40 degrees or so. Testing out the RCS system there, making sure it all works as intended. But uh, so far, other than a, a, an ascent that was a little steeper than I was planning or hoping for, everything's still going just fine. And uh, in a, I guess, a decent feat of timing, that upper stage burns out pretty much just as we reach the top of the atmosphere. Fire up the RCS thrusters and move us away from it. Let it drift harmlessly away from us. And then we prep the second stage engine for firing. And we take a look at everything else. We open the solar panels, make sure they're all working. And hey, look at that, we got all four. We're up two from last time. Deploy the radio antenna, and away we go. A little bit of time skip trick. Brings us to the circularization burn. Now that we're up a little closer to the apoapsis, and, you know, it's all pretty standard again here. It's, uh, it's all working pretty well. My hopes are high. I'm feeling good. Doing a little check here to see how the slope or how the inclination of my orbit is shaping up. Not so much the inclination, I mean, I, I know the inclination is going to be approximately 29, 29 degrees just because I took off from a place that was inclined at 29 degrees. That's, that's, why, that's why Cape Canaveral is where it is, or at least it's a big part of the reason. It's because you can launch into orbit and you're, if you time it right, you're basically inclined with the moon and you just got to transfer out don't need to burn precious extra fuel changing your inclination because it does take a lot of precious fuel just to, just to get into orbit and then a lot more to get yourself out to the moon but again everything is uh, everything's looking good at this point nothing broke off during launch nothing decoupled at the wrong time nothing exploded inside the payload fairing and it was only the third try, which is great because I'm at this point I'm still having kind of nightmare memories of the 
10 or 12 attempts I had to make at getting that biosample recovery satellite, the regular ordinary Swedish science time satellite, to come back just from low orbit, intact with its science. But of course the fact that that happened is what's allowing this flight to happen with all of our fancy tech level 3 rocket technology and the new engines we unlocked and the better efficiencies and the reduced engine masses and all of those all those little things which add up to a real big benefit. Speaking of big benefits, we actually uh, that that kick motor that I tried on the Alice Mark One, losing that, even putting in a bunch of rocket fuel into that tank and a little rocket engine and some hydrazine, adding the mass of the liquid fueled rocket, I think it was still less than that little totally uncontrollable, totally unthrottleable solid fuel rocket. So we're still getting a bit better performance out of that upper stage. And even with a maybe not perfectly efficient ascent that was a little too steep, we should still be in pretty good shape to uh, make that transfer burn. Speaking of good shape to make that transfer burn, I think I just missed commenting on myself checking the relative inclination that I was at with the moon. Uh, 0.4 degrees inclination difference that I'll have to that I'll have to make up for at some point when I do a course correction halfway out to the moon. 0.4 degrees. Considering I eyeballed the launch window, I'd say that's pretty damn good. I was I was more than satisfied with myself. I was feeling really good. Now I was thinking, damn, I'm good. Of course, then I immediately thought, maybe I shouldn't say that until I've actually done the mission, because the game will know I'm being cocky and it'll blow up my rocket on me. The, the deep space kraken will strike, or something like that. For those of you unfamiliar, the deep space kraken is a storied phenomenon. Actually, one I haven't really encountered too much of, but it's, uh, it's basically a series or a set of glitches which kind of got their own name, where basically physics would glitch out and parts would just spontaneously explode or crash into each other and end up flying away from the solar system at the speed of light or some other craziness. But as it is, though, there's been no Kraken strikes yet, even with my, with my high spirits and confidence. And there we go, we'll finish off the transfer burn with a bit of that fuel on the satellite. But as you can see there, there's still plenty to spare, because hey, we're going to get to the moon now. We aren't there yet, but we're on a path that'll take us there, and we've still got, you know, almost 2,000 meters per second of delta V. We can do all sorts of maneuvering. We've got all sorts of room to screw up and still be able to fix it, and that's always a good thing. Speaking of fixing it, now I'm plotting uh, the mid-course correction to actually fly over the moon instead of crashing into it. Because if I don't do anything at this point, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to crash into the moon. And that's when it first starts occurring to me as I'm plotting this course correction. I'm thinking, wait a minute. Maybe this probe is an impactor. Maybe it's supposed to crash into the moon. Maybe that's part of the experiment. Hmm... Maybe I should have looked that up before I started doing this. <laughs> he thought to himself, his past self thought to himself. But this is present me, or if you ask past me, it's future me. Or if you ask yourself, it's slightly less past me. But in any case, now that we've got that long-range communication dish pointed at our geostationary comsat mark 1 we can come all the way out here and maintain comms with the planet earth so that we can keep controlling this thing rather than having it you know crash uncontrollably into the moon and we're setting up for that course correction now to prevent just that and there's my off in the distance there around the moon now are my failed attempts the two alice mark 1s which disintegrated in deep space upon decoupling from the upper stage of their carrier rocket through the mysterious forces of 
balloon tank no clip. There we go. Just like that, we've got something resembling a close approach to the moon. Now I'm thinking about doing another correction, but then I realize that it's just not worth doing. Usually a small course correction like that is pretty hard to do. You're better off, when you're that close, you're better off waiting until now, when we get into the moon's sphere of influence, and just doing a course correction then. Sometimes it's, if you've got the fuel, it's sometimes easier to just do a course correction at a point where it takes you 5 or 10 meters per second, rather than trying to get one exactly right when you only need about 0.2. Because even that wasn't exactly right. I end up coming in shallower than I'd intended, but then I think, well, 17 kilometers is probably still high enough. It's cutting it close. I'm going to be skimming the surface probably, but uh, I decide to go for it. And then I start collecting data because I realize that the first experiment that I do is actually collecting telemetry in high orbit of the moon. So we fill up the science tank, or the data tank, as I like to call it. We run that experiment. 100-odd science? I'll take it. The whole experiment just being to see if we can still talk to the probe. The fact that we can do it means that we can talk to the probe. If we couldn't talk to the probe, we wouldn't have been able to collect the data in the first place. But hey, whatever. Success. We got ourselves some telemetry. And I decide, you know what? I don't think we got all that science. At this point, I'm well aware of the fact that most of the experiments I do these days, I'm going to get 75% of the recoverable science from. And hey, look at that. There's 25% left. Let's run this bad boy again and see if we can get a little more of that. Precious data. Precious science. I keep mixing up science and data. I call the data tank a science tank, and then I call science data. There we go, rushing up toward the moon at time accelerated time warp. Time warp squared. Coming up nice and close now. What a beautiful sight the moon is from a mere thousand kilometers above. It's a hell of a lot bigger than it does from way back there on Earth. And don't you worry. It's about to get a whole lot bigger. You thought it looked big at a thousand kilometers? For for those stock KSP players watching, a thousand kilometers away from Kerbin's moon still looks pretty small. Oh, look at this. <laughs> it's getting a whole lot bigger now. We're still a hundred and some odd kilometers up, and it's... I mean, I, I think, well, this, this moon, the real moon, is bigger than Kerbin. It's way bigger than Kerbin, I think. Kerbin's actually a pretty small place in the stock game. And here we go. Coming down lower and lower. I'm actually not sure as I do this. I'm wondering when to start the second experiment. I know I have to get pretty low, which is why I've set it to get, you know, pretty low. I think it's 15 kilometers now. But uh, the, the, the big concern is that I, I, need to, I need to give myself time to run the experiment, collect any data I might need to collect, and transmit, well, not necessarily transmit the data home, but basically when I get below the altitude I need to be at, I've got to be there for enough time to actually run the experiment. If I don't run the entire experiment, then it's all for naught, and it's, you know, I, I'd have to try to bring it back again. Which, worst case scenario, I've got the fuel that I can do that if I need to. I'm coming down lower over the moon, and it's <laughs> it's kind of scary, to be honest. I'm thinking it's like, wow. God, this looks like, God, those mountains look like they're close. God, they're, looking, they're even closer. Jeez, those ones up ahead are even higher. I start worrying about these things, because, again, you know, I'm, I'm still used to stock KSP, too. Usually the moon doesn't look like this in the stock game until you're like 500 meters from the surface and we're 25 kilometers up. Speaking of which, we're releasing the chemical. I'm not sure what the threshold was, but I decided to check at 25 kilometers just in case and lo and behold, started spewing that chemical out from the, 
little tank inside the probe. Now it's all gone. Run that experiment. We got lots of time. Nothing to worry about now. We're still descending. Look at that. More than 400 science. Success! Great success. Now that I've done the experiment with time to spare, now I'm kind of worrying about, well, collecting the rest of the science for starters, but then I'm kind of worried about that next mountain that's coming up awfully close, and I'm watching my true altitude fall. Well, that's rising, and now it's falling, and now I'm coming real close over it, and it's like, oh my god. But... Okay, that wasn't so bad. That was like three kilometers above it. But it didn't look like that to me at the time. It's easy to say now as I'm doing commentary, yeah, it wasn't so bad, but I didn't know. <laughs> I, I didn't know how high that mountain was. I thought I figured I was probably okay, but I was still worried. Still worried. In any case turn that probe around, because I figure, let's use some of this extra fuel. The path I was on was going to have this thing just escaping the moon, and then escaping Kerbin, so... Hell with it. Burn some of that fuel. We've got all this perfectly good communications equipment here, and a perfectly good battery, and perfectly good solar panels. I think this thing can have a dual purpose, as a communication satellite. That's what I do. I capture it into lunar orbit. And then, as you can see here, I'm being smart. I'm being very smart and making sure the solar panels are facing the sun again. Because I don't have those ones that automatically rotate to face the sun yet. So I've got to make sure myself that they're facing the sun so that the batteries don't die. So I do that. Because it's going to be it's going to be a while before I get out here to the circularization burn. Of course, it's not a while for us, thanks to the wonders of playback acceleration and video editing. Trust me, you guys will be thankful for all this video editing. This video came from about 3 hours and 35 minutes of raw footage. I don't think you would want to watch 3 hours and 35 minutes of raw footage, especially because the first hour would have just been me dicking around in the VAB trying to build that rocket. It takes me such a long time to do that. It's, I'm, I don't know if I'm perfectionist, or I want to consider all the options. I want to look at ten different engines every single time I want to, I go to pick one. So we get ourselves, we're into a nice circular 10,000 kilometer high orbit of the moon, and then I think, crap, wait a minute. That omnidirectional antenna has a range of exactly 10,000 kilometers. So that's not really going to do me any good for anything that's on the surface of the moon. So, well, okay. Still got, again, lots of fuel left. So, turn her around again. Now that we brought that periapsis up to 10,000 kilometers, we'll burn some more fuel because we got it to spare. Bring it back down to about 8,000 kilometers. And then, with one last maneuver to go, just to circularize at 8,000 kilometers, what do you suppose I forget to do? Wait for it. Wait for it. See which way it's facing. Is there blue facing the sun or gray? Eh. <laughs> and the batteries are dead. Not even halfway there and the batteries were dead. So, I realize this. I let it come down at a time warp when I get into position, and I'm just... Uh, really? All those times where I remembered, and then the last time I had to remember, I forgot. But, hey, all is not lost. This thing is in orbit. It's not going anywhere. I just haven't finished circularizing it yet. So we'll leave it there until such a time as maybe we can get the sun to face it a little better in six months or so when it's kind of coming, the sunlight's coming from kind of the other direction relative to us, maybe. We'll revisit that one in a probably much later episode. But for now, it's time to have a look at the bounty of science we got from our latest mission low, 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 low over the moon. Scary low over the moon. 
and as you can see, the next step was definitely some tier 3 solid rockets to go with our tier 3 liquid rockets. More power, more power! And since we still got so much to spare, I'm looking at some other stuff thinking, well... Not much that I need in the electronics, or I don't need landing gear. You know, don't really need too much of that. I don't really need any aerodynamic stuff. So, Venera 1 and Mars 1. We can probably even launch those in the next episode, because it's going to take them a while to get to where they need to go. I think beyond that, what do I do? What else? Yes, I get the next stage of comms equipment, because I'll need the next stage of comms equipment to send those Mars and Venera probes to their destinations and still be able to talk to them. In any case, that is about it for Episode 7. See, it wasn't three hours long. That wasn't so bad. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and as you, as I hope I, you enjoy all of them. And we will uh, we'll see you next time, maybe for a trip to the beginnings of a trip to Mars. Or at the very least, another trip to the moon. Today's episode of Space's Hard Vacuum is brought to you by the number 0 0.4. And the phrase of the day is... Boom. Hitshot. Happy kerbling.